we are celebrating on this Lord's Day, Mother's Day. And every one of us, without exception, were brought into this world, and we owe our existence in part to a mother. The Word of God tells us that we are to honor both our fathers and our mothers. In fact, it says it is the first commandment that is with promise. And so we are in obedience to this command by honoring our mothers today. However, understand that that is not the primary purpose for us coming here. You understand that, amen? The primary purpose for us coming here is so that um, we would honor our God and to worship Him. And we understand that God's command to honor our mothers was not intended for us to just celebrate one day of the year, our mothers, but rather it was an honoring of them continually. And, and, and when, we honor our, when we honor our mothers based upon the command of God to honor them, we are in essence honoring God. Did you follow that train of thought? And so what I'm trying to say here is whenever we dedicate a sermon such as this on a Sunday morning, which is the Lord's Day, to honor our mothers, we are in essence honoring God at the same time. There's nothing wrong with that. But one thing that I want to get clear here is we don't honor mothers based upon their performance as a mother. Let's just be honest. There are a lot of mothers, especially nowadays, who are not living up to the calling of motherhood, just as there are many fathers who are not living up to the calling of being fathers. But as children of God, we are not exempt from his commands, right? And his command is that we honor our mothers, regardless. By being obedient and honoring them, we honor him in that way. And so, as I was saying, we honor our moms, not based on their performance, but we honor them based on their position as a mother. And, that, and for that, God commands us to honor them indefinitely, always, continually, unconditionally. Whether you approve of your mother's mothering methods or not, your mother was given to you by God hand-selected especially for you to be your mom in particular. And you were, if you were anything like me as a child, let me tell you, that was not always an easy job. God gave us mothers. Genesis 3.20 tells us, and Adam called his wife, wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And therefore, by being thankful for mothers today, it is in essence being thankful to God because he's the source, he's the giver of moms. And I, for one, I will be grateful for God's gift to me. How about you? Amen? Amen. But not only am I grateful for my mom, I'm also grateful for the mother of my children. I'm grateful for my wife. And she's my best friend. Where did that come from? All right, here we go. Uh, All right. So we're going to have some brisket today later. Anyway. What I'm trying to say is today, mothers, we rise up and call you blessed. Now, when it comes to speaking about mothers in the Bible, there are plenty of examples that we could choose from. But this morning, we're going to be looking at Hannah, the woman who would eventually become the mother of the prophet Samuel. So if you haven't already, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, which is page um, 264 in the church Bibles under the chairs in front of you. 1 Samuel 1 is where we're going to be. I want to begin, first of all, in this text, looking at the plea to be a mother from this woman, Hannah, who was unable to be one. I want to look at her plea to be a mother. You'll find that in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1. And there God's word tells us concerning Hannah. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child that I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. I believe that most of us here, we are familiar with the biblical account in the story of Hannah. She so desired, so longed to be a mother. But for whatever reason, she was unable to conceive. She could not conceive. In fact, um, we actually know the reason why she couldn't. Because the Bible tells us plainly in two different instances, both at the end of verse 5 and at the end of verse 6, we read these same words, the Lord had shut up her womb. The Lord had shut it up. 
I want to pause there for just a moment before we actually dive into this text because I realize that for many mothers, Mother's Day is not, I'm sorry, for many women, Mother's Day is not a celebration for them. In fact, it is a day that they dread. It is a day of emotional pain for them because while they yearn to have a child, they are unable to due to infertility. And I can't explain why that is, that that so many who want to have a child are unable to. In fact, according to the latest statistics, one out of every eight couples are unable to have children. I can't explain that, and I can't explain why there are so many others who don't desire to have a child. In fact, the women are horrified when they find out that they have conceived, and they go on to terminate the life of that baby while it is still within their wombs. I can't explain that. All I know is that God is in control. But speaking of this, by the way, speaking of abortion, isn't that great news that's coming out nowadays about the overturning of Roe? If that is truly the case, and that is what is going to take place by the Supreme Supreme Court's ruling, well, praise God for that. But let me just tell you, the victory is not won, and it's not done yet. We need to be praying for our, our, our elected officials and, and, and those who are over the state, not just our state, but every other state, that they would all put into law without exception that murdering unborn babies, regardless of what they label it as, murdering of unborn babies is illegal and punishable. We need to be praying about that. But here in 1 Samuel 1, we find that Hannah had no children because she was barren. And while we don't understand why that happens to so many who want to have children, we can trust that our loving God is the same one who is in control of it. The same God who loves you tremendously, as was sung about earlier, earlier, will go to all kinds of lengths. He even sent his own son to die on your behalf so you would be saved. That same loving God is in control of the situation. He's the one who closes and opens the womb. He's the one, Scripture says, that gives and takes life. And he is also the one who knows what is best and he knows what will bring the greatest outcome and the greatest spiritual harvest for his eternal kingdom. I realize that that may not remove the emotional pain and I don't expect it to. But I hope that those who this pertains to are comforted by this much, that you can know that God has a plan for you. And for reasons only known to him, this is part of it. But please hear me out. It is not punishment. And it is not a curse. And you are not defective. You are exactly the way that your loving God created you to be. I don't know why it is, but I do know this. God's the one who's in control of it. The Bible says clearly, he closed her womb. And for those who maybe this pertains to, or you know somebody who does, listen, another scenario, scenario may be that perhaps God is just waiting for the perfect moment to give you a child. In spite of what the doctors and in spite of what the medical field are, are telling you, maybe God's just waiting for that perfect, perfect moment. Perhaps he will do for you as he did for other women, godly women who are in the Bible. Open your womb later in life, late in life so that his name would be praised and glorified and all who are around you will know that only God could do this thing. Women such as Hannah, as we're going to look at this morning, women such as Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel, which are three out of the four matriarchs in the book of Genesis, they were all unable to bear children, but yet to their amazement and the amazement of everybody else around them, God gave them children. Samson's mother, the Shunammite woman who ministered to Elisha, John the Baptist's mother at one time, they all fell into this category. And it was never about a curse. It was never about a punishment. It was all for the glory of God. And it's all because God had a plan later on in their lives. God simply waited for the perfect time to bless them with children. And therefore, they were forced to wait. But here's the deal. They did not waste their waiting. In all those situations, those ladies were praying. They drew closer to God. They constantly showed their belief that God alone had the power to open their womb and to give them children. And they cried out to him continuously. Or perhaps it could be that God has another plan in mind. Maybe it is his will that you are unable to bear children so that you could later foster or adopt children whose own mothers have abandoned them and forsaken them. And that you would be the hero who steps in into that position and you fulfill the role of a mother for that person. Who knows? And so this Mother's Day, as we get into this, I pray that if this involves you, that you would at least be thankful, number one, to God for your own mother. 
but also that you'd be encouraged in knowing that God has this under control, and it is in his hands. Amen? In our text, however, we find Hannah here. She's desperately wanting to be a mother. And if being barren wasn't bad enough, Hannah was continually afflicted by an adversary in her own home that constantly reminded her of her inability to have children. You see, the book opens up, and we're first introduced to Elkanah in in verse 1, who is Hannah's husband, and he came from a prestigious lineage, which was given to us in verse 1, and there is said that that he is an Ephrathite, or originally what that means is he was from Ephrathah, which was the ancient name for the city of Bethlehem. But over in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, we find that he is also of a Kohathite division there within the Levitical tribe. Now, the Kohathites, they were the ones who were in charge of the most holy portion of, in the vessels of the tabernacle, including the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The Kohathites were the ones who tended to all that and who took care of that. And so here's this Levitical man who is in that lineage, and that was part of his responsibilities. He's from this prestigious lineage. And it opens up and talking about how his father was Jeroham and his grandfather was Elihu and his great grandfather was Tohu and his great great grandfather was Zuf. You see, a man's lineage was everything in Jewish society. It was everything. But that went double, especially for those Jews who are part of the Levitical lineage. Now, here's the point. Without a son to carry on his name, Elkanah would have been the last in that list. It would have ended with him if he was unable to have a son. And so in verse 2, what we find is we are introduced, as we're introduced to Hannah, we also find that Elkanah had also taken another wife along with Hannah. And her name was Peninnah. And while Hannah was infertile and had no children, Peninnah was very fruitful and provided several children for their husband. Now we have to keep in mind here, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, this was during the time of the judges. This was taking place during that time when it was spiritually dark for the nation of Israel. And according to the scripture, uh, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, it was uh, relative moralism, right? What's right for me is right for me, and what's right for you is right for you, and the two do not cross. Everybody just did whatever they thought was right. And we oftentimes, we, in the Old Testament, we see these polygamous marriages, but I want you to understand it was never God's intention in marriage. It was never accepted by him either. God's plan from the very beginning was that marriage would would be between one man and one woman for a lifetime. From the very creation itself, we're told, relating to marriage, Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, singular, not plural, wife, and they shall be one flesh. And then Jesus added this after he quoted that in the Gospels in Mark chapter 10. He added this after he said that. He said, and they twain, or that is they two, shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. That word twain in, the, in our Bibles is translated as the word two 122 times. It's only translated twain 10 times in our Bibles. So this is what Jesus is saying. They two, so you take two. You got one man, you got one woman. What do you got? Two people, right? This was God's plan from his very design. One man for one woman, one woman for one man. But because of man's sinfulness and because of the, the influence and the acceptance of cultural practices of the pagans around them, we see several cases in the Bible where men, even men of God, took more than one wife. But Let me just tell you, rest assured, it never, never, never worked out for them. In every situation, if you follow the story along of every one of these men who did this, you will find without fail, it always brought family conflict, it brought division, and in some cases it brought violence and even murder within the families. But here's the deal. The reason I give you all that background is so you can understand this. It is possible, in fact, very likely that the reason Elkanah has two wives was that after he realized that Hannah was unable to bear him a son, he took this new bride, Penana, 
in order to fulfill that purpose for him. Now, just because that may explain it, that does not excuse it. Amen? We're all on the same page here. As I said earlier, if being barren wasn't bad enough for her, Hannah was continually afflicted by an adversary in her own home. You see, we read in verses 4 and 5 that as Elkanah went up yearly to the tabernacle, which he's required to do, to go for the religious festival and to, to offer those sacrifices, he would take his whole family with him. And verse 4 says, when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters, portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. You see, although Penana was able to bear children, many children, sons and daughters for him, yet Elkanah did not hide who it was he loved within his marriage. In fact, every year at this time, he showed it publicly before everybody who was around, before Penana, as well as her sons and her daughters. He put on this display where he was showing his greater love for Hannah. And we can imagine how that would have re resonated within Penana. In fact, we don't have to imagine because the Bible tells us very clearly. Look at verse 6. And her adversary, that is speaking of Penana, also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? His heart is in the right place. But poor Elkanah, typical man, right? He didn't understand. He didn't get it. He honored Hannah. He elevated her. He made sure his whole household knew that she was the one who held his heart. And yet in spite of that, none of that, none of that love that he had for her, none of the love that she had for him could replace the love that she longed to share with a child of her own. To be a mother, it's not the same love. It's a powerful love that only exists between a mother and a child. In fact, God uses that example throughout Scripture to demonstrate how he will love his people, the nation of Israel, as well as believers. It's that unique love. I want you to notice, though, what Hannah does. It wasn't hopeless. I know it sounds like it was. It wasn't hopeless. She wasn't left unable to do anything. Granted, she cannot make it so that she, can't, that she can bear children. She can't do that for herself. But guess what? She knows who can. And that's who she takes it to. She leaves Elkanah and everyone else who's seated at the table there and she takes advantage of the fact that she is there at Shiloh. She's so near to the house of the Lord. She's there where the tabernacle of the Lord has been settled. And she runs to it and she throws herself down before God and she prays and she pours out her heart before God. And I want to tell you that that is the most powerful thing that we could possibly do with our despairs and with our brokenness is we could bring it to God and draw near to him in those times. Peter says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And the psalmist, he knew this quite well. He said many times, he said, the Lord, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And elsewhere he said, the Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him. And in another place he writes, and he healeth, in, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Draw near to the Lord. Listen, situations are not hopeless when you've got a God who sits on the throne of heaven. And her words, her prayer, are what we read was what we read at the beginning of the message. Those words that are found in verse eleven. Look at them again, if you would. It says that she vowed a vow, and said, "O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child." Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. That last statement, there shall no razor come upon his head, is a reference to the Nazarite vow. A, a setting aside of this young man, he was going to be unique. He's going to be special. He's not going to do what everybody else was doing. There are certain things that he would not do and certain things that he was dedicated to do. 
We are told in the Bible that there were only three men that we're aware of that took on a Nazarite vow for life. Now, there were many others who took on the Nazarite vow for uh, temporary short periods of time, but only three that we know of that are listed in the Bible. One was John the Baptist. The other was the judge Samson. And the third is this child who's going to be born to, to Hannah here, which is Samuel, the prophet. But in this prayer, Hannah promised to give back to God what she wanted him to give to her. Did you catch that? Hannah promised to give back to God what she wanted him to give to her. She sacrificed to the Lord something that she had not even received yet. And by the way, this shows us that Hannah wasn't in it for Hannah. You've got to get this. Hannah's not in it for Hannah. She didn't want a child just so that she could claim him and keep him all for herself. It wasn't for selfish ambition or for pride or so she can rub that nose of Peninnah in it. See, I can't have a child. It wasn't for any of that reason. She simply wanted God to give her the blessing of doing what he had wired her to love and to long for. And that was to give birth to a child, to bring life into this world. Now listen, I realize that what I'm about to say is going to fly in the face of our culture today, especially those who have been deceived and duped by the radical feminist movement. But this, this right here is part of God's plan and his blessed, his most blessed gift that he's given to women. Motherhood and bearing children. The Bible says that that is the heritage of the Lord. The, the, the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's the greatest blessing that God's given to women. And I realize that there are some exceptions, as we've already discussed here, and some for who his own purposes, God closes their womb, and others who also for his own purposes cause them to a life of singleness. But listen, this right here, this is the normal pattern of God for women. They bear children. And it's only a sign of the end times, by the way, which we're foretold, foretold of in Scripture, but it's only a sign of the end times that we're living in that women today are moving away from that normal pattern and that design of God. And, and the worst part of it is, by the way, Paul phrases it as um, without natural affection. But the worst part of it is, is that their agenda, their agenda is to cause our daughters to follow after them. They're promising them as the serpent did to Eve there in the Garden of Eden. They're promising them, no, 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 listen, eat of this. Eat of this. I'm telling you, your eyes will be wide open. You will be as God. Listen, he's trying to hold you back, Eve. He's trying to get you from enjoying things that that, that you want to enjoy. He's trying to get you to not reach your fullest potential. And that is the lie that they are telling our daughters today. And listen, Men are standing by dumbly and allowing it to happen. Just like Adam didn't go through that Adam and go through that garden and stomp out the head of the serpent. Men are standing by with their hands, you know, twiddling their thumbs like, well, okay, well, I guess it's their choice. I'm telling you, it's a deception. I digress. Hannah just wanted to be able to do what God had wired her to do, to bring a life into this world that's created in the Imago, Imago Dei, which is the image of God. She just wanted to be able to raise a child to nurture him in the knowledge of God for the glory of God. That's what marks a godly mother. That's what marks a godly mother. She wasn't even a mother yet, and yet still she bore the marks of one who would make a godly mother. For those of you who aren't mothers yet, ladies, do you see these marks in your life? First of all, we see that she was a devoted wife. She was the devoted wife, and in spite of her daily affliction of this other woman in her own home, who re- she, she still remained there. She still remained dedicated to her marriage and to her husband. Even though it was by his own foolish, stupid wrongdoing that she brought, that, that Peninnah was brought into their, their, the mix of their marriage, yet she still remained faithful and devoted to her husband. And she loved him. She wanted to bring him a child. She wanted to give him a namesake. She wanted to provide for him a son. By the way, mothers, one of the greatest things that you can do for your children is to show them that you and their father are madly in love. 
It's one of the greatest things you can do for your, your children. To let them know that you and their father, your husband, are in love. That, that, that you will always love one another. You may not always like one another, but let them know that you always love one another. That, that regardless, you're in it to win it. And there's no quit in this marriage. One of the best things that you can do for your household and your kids is to give them the security of that. That no matter what happens, no matter the problem, no matter the issue, no matter the offense, listen, forgiveness is greater than all of that. And the greater the offense, the greater the opportunity to, to forgive. Amen. You need to let your kids know that nobody's walking out of your marriage. Nobody. This is just my personal advice to you. I can't find it in scripture, but I can find a lot of where it kind of points to it. But my personal advice to you as a couple, never let the D word be spoken in your house. Never let your kids hear it come out of your lips. You know, that's something that happens in other households, but that'll never happen in our marriage, kids. You don't have to worry about that. She was a devoted wife. Not only that, but she was a praying woman. The first chance she got, she took her burdens to the only one who could bear them for her. Not only bear them, but she could actually, he could actually replace her burdens with blessings. She ran to the Lord, to the house of the Lord, and fell down before him and wept. She was continual in her prayer, according to verse 12. Later verses, we see she was passionate in her prayers. And from what we can tell in the text, she was going to continue to petition the Lord to remain there in prayer all night long if she had to, until she finally got an answer to her petition. Which finally, by the way, she does get an answer at the end of verse 17, when Eli, the high priest, walks in and he says to her, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked, that thou hast asked of him. She was a praying woman. How many times in the years following do you suppose that she rehearsed this night in these prayers with her son Samuel and reminded him, oh, by the way, you remember how, how you came about? You remember the prayers that I offered up for you? You remember the petition? Let me just tell you again how I wept and I poured myself out and I was, and I was, so, I was so grieved about it and I so wanted you as a child that, that, that I was even mistaken as somebody who, who was intoxicated because I was, just so, I was just so into praying to God for you. How many times do you think that she shared that story with Samuel about her prayers that night? In fact, his name itself, Samuel, is a testimony of her prayers for him. Samuel means heard of God or asked of God. Listen, praying mothers leave a lasting impact. A mother will carry her child in her womb for nine months or so, but a godly mother will carry her child in prayers for their lifetime. She will carry them before the Lord, before the throne of God himself for her whole life. Mom, let your kids hear about your praying for them. Let them hear about what you are praying for them. In fact, let them hear you praying for them. Tell your kids and remind them that you are continually petitioning God on their behalf. They need to know that because praying mothers leave a lasting impact. President Theodore Roosevelt said, praying mothers are America's greatest assets. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, I cannot tell you how much I owe to the prayers of my mother. And then President Abraham Lincoln said, no one is poor who had a godly mother. And then he went on to say, I remember my mother's prayers and they have followed me. They have clung to me all my life. We see that Hannah was a praying woman. Not only that, but she also was a faith-filled woman. After receiving the blessings from Eli, she responds. Look at the end of verse 18 there. Look at how she responds. Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. And then we read this. So, so the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. All of her weeping, her refusal to eat, her bitterness of soul, they were all gone. When she got up from the altar, listen, she was changed. When she got up, she walked away different than when she came. Why? Because she had a child? No, but because she had faith that God was going to give her a child. And that changed everything. She had done what she could do, and now she anticipated that God was going to do what he would do. And it shows that she accepted the, the answer that she'd received by faith. 
In other words, she went out and she looked for the answer to her prayers. She was looking for it to come. I don't want to sound inappropriate or irreverent, especially standing behind this pulpit, but we are led to believe that as soon as she left, as soon as she got home with her husband, she put her faith to the test. Verse 19 tells us, and they rose up early morning, they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord, which by the way, what a wonderful picture that is. A husband and wife worshiping the Lord early in the morning together. It says, and returned and came to their house and Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Listen, she didn't waste any time. She wanted to see the answer that God had given to her. Why? Because she had faith that God had heard her prayers and would answer them. We're told the Lord remembered her. She has this baby. She names him Samuel, which is a testimony as I already made mention of. But look at verse 21. Time passes. And now Elkanah is going back up another yearly visit there at the tabernacle after the baby's been born. It says, And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Now, now listen, a Jewish woman usually would wean her child, at least in relation to breastfeeding. A Jewish woman would usually wean her child into the second and third year of their life. But that word wean itself is not limited to breastfeeding, all right? The word wean is actually implies to fulfill fully, to fulfill fully. The weaning process possibly involved Hannah here rearing and training Samuel up to the age of five, six, maybe even seven years of age. And then she took him. But in those years, she was weaning him. She was fulfilling fully the vow that she had made to God, getting him ready, preparing him, setting him aside, teaching him everything that he would know at that young age about what God had planned for him and what she had committed him to do. You know, scientific research today shows us that the first five years of life are some of the most influential years in a child's development. Did you know that? 90% of a child's brain develops by age five. 90%. One article states this. They develop connections faster in the first five years than at any other time in their lives. This is the time when the foundations for learning, health, and behavior throughout their life are laid down within the first five years. And statistically, we know that it's mothers who spend the greater amount of time with children in those most impressionable years. You think that's a mistake? You think that's just coincidence? No, that's part of God's planning. You see, a mother's role is so impactful in the lives of her children. Proverbs 1.8 tells us, My son, hear the instruction of thy father. And then it says this, And forsake not the law of thy mother. That Hebrew word for law is the word Torah. You know what the Torah is, but the definition of this word refers to the precepts of God's word, particularly the Torah is the first five books of God's word, of of the Bible. Charles Wesley said this. Charles Wesley, uh, who headed up the the, the Methodist uh, movement, he said, I learned more about God from my mother than from all the theologians in England. Church, that's high praise for the impact of a godly mother. Parents, Mothers and fathers alike, we are the primary influencers in the life of our children. Amen. Not the not the schools. Not even the church. We are. We are the model, we are the example that they see lived out before them every single day. And we have the greatest impact on our kids, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Stop blaming everybody else. If there's someone to blame, look in the mirror. It's us. We have the greatest impact. Listen, spiritually is the most important of all of it because everything relates back to your spiritual, your, your spiritual being. And we are the ones who influence, influence them the greatest spiritually. We're the initial gateway that lead them to God. We are the primary evangelists that bring them the gospel. We are the disciple makers, the key disciple makers in our homes. We preach to them not only through the words that we share with them. God bless my children. Oh, 
The children of a pastor, as Brother James put earlier, you get to hear so many words. But let me tell you, far greater than those words and what resonates more is the life that they see that we live to them and preach to them. It's been said that the living room is the greatest classroom that your children will ever sit in. Someone else said that the kitchen table is the pulpit where some of the most impactful sermons your child will ever hear will come from. The kitchen table. Parents, it's up to us. But here's the final quality and the attribute that I want us to see about Hannah. She was a God-honoring mother. When she became a mom, she honored the Lord with what he gave to her. Hannah weaned him for however many years it was, and then she gave him back to God for his use, for his glory. Gave him back. But you got to understand, she wasn't alone in this. Samuel was Elkanah's firstborn son from Hannah, the wife he loved. She wasn't alone in this. He supported her vow, and he permitted it to take place. Long story short, by God's own command, the husband had a right to disannul, to, to cancel out that vow and say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. He had a right to do that, and then she would be free of the vow before her and God. But he permitted it. He said, that's the vow that you've made? Fine, we're going to do that. God gave you the shot based on that vow? Then we're going to do that. He permitted it. They together gave Samuel back to God. So let me ask you, parents, have you given your family to the Lord? Have you given your family to the Lord? Are we honoring the Lord by giving our family, our home, our children back to him for his glory, for his plans, for his purposes? Are you encouraging your kids not to chase after their dreams, but rather chase after the calling and the will of God? The very reason, the purpose that he created you and gave you your interests and your talents and your passions and your abilities. Have you, are you encouraging your kids to chase after that? Have you given your family to God? Oh, boy, I'm, I'm itching. I know, I know. I'm itching. Probably the most convicting thing about this whole thing, let's just move on. The most convicting thing about this whole thing concerning Hannah, at least for me anyway, is that it makes me wonder what would happen if more parents, if more fathers and more mothers too, would make more trips to the altar on behalf of their children. What would happen if we wept more and poured more out to God in prayer? Not necessarily that we might have children like Hannah did here. Now, maybe for some, that would be it. But for some of us, that we might just regain our children. That we might be able to reclaim them and have another chance to reclaim them and regain them from this world and the satanic influence that is in this world, from the lies and the deceit and the drug abuse and the false promises and the sexual immorality and the perversions and from the, the mirage of success that, well, that next promotion, that next paycheck, that next raise, that's what your soul is longing for. That's going to give you the satisfaction of, in life. What if, what if we, we were to pour ourselves out and, and we were to pray to God, give us one more chance, God, to be able to reclaim them and then give them back to you? What, if the, what would happen if the church floors here were stained with the tears of parents who were praying for their kids and grandparents who got on board and prayed for their grandchildren? People who were begging God to allow us that chance to give our children back to you, God. What would it be like that's what was said of this church. God help us. I know that this is a Mother's Day, ser uh, Mother's Day uh, celebration, but greater than that, this is the Lord's Day. And this message is for all of us. If you follow the this, this story of Samuel, you'll see that God used him uh, to be the final judge and the prophet that would transition the nation of Israel out of that, those dark times of the judges. And Samuel was the one who anointed the first king of Israel, and later on the greatest king of Israel, through whose seed God sent his son, our Savior, through. And Hannah was made a part of that great plan simply because she was a devoted wife who prayed passionately, who was full of faith, a mother who weaned her child to serve the Lord and then gave him back to God for his use. 
What would Edmund Road Baptist Church look like if we did the same? Is there a godly mother here today? Is that you? Are there godly fathers who lead and love and nurture their wives to be such mothers as this? Are there godly children, teenagers, even adult kids who honor their mothers and their fathers? Who indeed hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother? I ask again, what would Edmund Road Baptist Church look like if we did the same as this? If we had more godly mothers like Hannah? If we had more supportive, leading husbands like Elkanah? If we had more submissive children like Samuel? Oh, what God could do with a church filled with families such as that. Families that give themselves to the Lord, offer their children to Him and not to the world and its exploits. Those who are dedicated as unto the Lord. Who's it going to start with in your family? Who's it going to start with in your home? How about you? Are you the one? Will you make a vow to God today? Will you let it start with you? What a great example we see in Hannah, a godly mom.